Walmart has been doing very well since the start of the pandemic. In a recent CNBC interview, their CEO, Doug McMillan, called for a new stimulus to help smaller businesses, and he vaguely said that big firms like his had been better able to weather the storm. That might be the understatement of the century. Walmart's e-commerce sales are up 97% since the first quarter of the year. It's hired half a million new workers. To put that into perspective, it was already the largest private sector employer in the United States. Any job growth is good news as far as that goes, but if even more people are working for them and they're taking up an even bigger share of the economic pie, that's a problem for anyone who cares about creating a more equal society. Walmart pays poverty wages to its own quote-unquote associates, drives down wages in the companies that supply it, and aggressively busts unions. A lot of progressives just seem to want to stop the company from expanding. Some might dream of breaking it up into a number of smaller pieces, but these solutions don't get to the core of the problem. Instead, we need to nationalize it. Walmart is bad news. Even before the pandemic, the Walton family was making more than a combined 43% of the American public. This year, the combined fortunes of the various Waltons increased by a whopping $43.2 billion. The reason that's a problem is not that it's a bad thing that a company is providing a service and making lots of money. It's that a tiny handful of people are calling the shots within that company and giving themselves the biggest piece of the pie. Walmart associates, who have been working there for decades, are still making less than $15 an hour. The company has long been a notorious union buster, surveilling employees, forcing them to sit through anti-union training videos, setting up a hotline for managers to report union activity, and even preemptively closing stores to foil unionization efforts. It also drives economic inequality outside of its own corporate borders through the so-called Walmart effect, whereby both suppliers and competitors are incentivized to slash their own employees' wages. So what's the solution? Efforts to build new Walmart locations are often met with local resistance. While some of this has been shown to be funded by rival retailers, much of it stems from good people, motivated by concerns ranging from a general distaste for corporate homogenization to serious alarm at the company's ecological footprint. Some of these stop Walmart types might wish the company would just go away, but imagine that a magical genie actually granted this wish tomorrow. The disappearance of the largest private sector employer in the country would mean the loss of millions of jobs. Even if other smaller retailers rehired most of those unemployed associates, the transition would be brutal and wages at these smaller firms would often be even lower. Similar worries would apply if we could apply the progressive populist solution of breaking up the chain into a number of smaller pieces. As each of the new competitors scrambled for market share, workers would quite likely be the losers. Another issue is that 156 U.S. stores for low-cost groceries. A better solution is to simply bring the entire chain into public ownership and rechristen it as something like Public Mart or America Mart. Now, I understand that some conservative and libertarian viewers are jumping up and down their seats at this point, ready to remind us of what nationalized grocery stores were like in the Soviet Union. There's a reason they'll want to point out that Boris Yeltsin was so impressed when he visited a grocery store in Texas in 1989. Do socialists really want to recreate the kind of shopping experience that Yeltsin was used to in Moscow? But this objection misses the mark in a couple of ways. While socialists argue among themselves about whether some higher tech or more democratic version of economic planning could avoid the problems that plague the Soviet model, or whether the kind of socialism that we could realistically hope to achieve at this point in history would still have to include some kind of market sector of competing worker co-ops, none of these worries touch the proposal to nationalize Walmart. For one thing, what we're talking about here wouldn't be a public monopoly in grocery shopping, but just a public option. And if you want to argue that Walmart has so few competitors in some areas 
that it's a near monopoly, you've just strengthened the case for nationalizing it. After all, whatever you think of public monopolies, private monopolies are a whole lot worse. If only one chain is going to service a given area, you want that chain to be owned by the government and operated in the public interest and not owned by a few stockholders and operated in their interest. To really put that point into perspective, almost half of Walmart's stock is owned by a single ultra-wealthy family. At least politicians have to be elected and re-elected by the general public. Theoretically, we can vote them out if we think they're doing a bad job. The board of Walmart is only accountable to the Walton family and other stockholders. Beyond this, the reason there were empty shelves in grocery stores in Moscow in 1989 was not that the managers of the nationalized grocery stores were making bad ordering decisions. It was that the Soviet planning office, Goshplan, wasn't having enough of the goods consumers wanted produced in the first place. Nationalizing Walmart wouldn't necessarily mean nationalizing its suppliers. It would, however, make it possible for a future socialist government to engineer a reverse Walmart effect, whereby America Mart, or whatever we're calling it, would only order from suppliers that paid their employees a living wage. There's no think that this couldn't be done while still supplying many millions of Americans with relatively low-cost groceries. Just look at the United States Postal Service, which provides an enormous number of good unionized public sector jobs, historically making it an engine of both upward mobility and racial equality, at the same time as being so cost efficient that they'll take a postcard from California to an address in Alaska for 35 cents. Nationalizing Walmart would not be a utopian panacea. America Mart might have some of the same problems we associate with the company that we know and hate right now. But it wouldn't have to be a panacea to be a dramatic improvement over what currently exists. We're talking here about a company that's been forced year after year to pay sums, sometimes running to tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars to settle class action lawsuits for forcing its associates to work off the clock, denying them legally required rest and meal breaks, stealing their wages, secretly taking out life insurance policies on them and naming itself as the beneficiary, a practice that's been charmingly nicknamed dead peasant insurance, discriminating against pregnant women and violating basic safety practices. Bringing the company into public ownership might not solve all the problems Walmart creates overnight, but it would be a long step towards justice.